GT Channel with Sam Itani, James McKeon, and Taro Koki. Oh, hello, hello. Hi, everybody. We are back here for Podspeed 19. Um, and it looks like we're getting more and more uh, viewers every week. So uh, that's really good news. Um, well, uh, I don't know how the uh, videos are set up, but uh, to my left on my video is Taro Koki, who is the uh, president of GT Channel and producer of this wonderful podcast, live cast. Hello, hello. Um, below him, or on my video, is uh, James McKeown. He is of uh, the host of No Breaking and um, just kicking it in his bedroom during this uh, quarantine. Um, have you gotten out of the bedroom at all? James? Only to the bathroom, Sam, and then sometimes the kitchen, but very rarely anywhere else. If I am, it's in one of my loaner vehicles that I've been spending time in just to make sure to give some very uh, valid and enjoyable uh, content for GT Channel there at the No Breaking website. And you have been busy uh, evaluating cars for GT Channel, correct? And there has been a couple there. Yes, I'll talk about two more today that we'll get to later. And I've also got one upcoming for our next episode on the 4th and then one for, I think, the 18th. I think the next one after that is right. That's it, awesome. The one on the 18th is actually probably most relevant to our, our guest today. Who is our guest, Sam? Well, you're not going to be able to see his face because he's had some technical difficulties from his uh, offices. And, um, he's got a green face. Yeah, but I will... Uh, but, uh, <laughs> I will say he his office is in Plano, Texas, so you probably know where, what company he works for right now. But our guest today is Mo Durand. He is a uh, he is a well, not just a Japanese car enthusiast. He has worked in the industry for as long as almost as I have, as long as I can remember. And he has been um, with um, Mitsubishi, uh, Nissan, now Toyota, and now he Ford. is the Ford too. Ford. Ford oh, too. I, for, I forgot Ford. Okay, Ford. that's right, <laughs> Ford. So yeah, yeah I'm and, I'm pretty much the, the the town pump of PR. Oh so, my yeah, goodness, I'm, I've been all over. Yeah. Wait a minute, and that's when uh, wasn't that uh, during when Ford was uh, uh, owned Mazda, or was that just off? That was I worked I worked for Ford uh, under John Kleiner, I think from about 2003 yeah. to if I remember about 2006, and that was with PAG, and they had that's their right. hands in Mazda. Yeah, so it was. So Jack, you're yeah, indirectly. Jack Nasser yeah. left something. Nasser, yeah. yeah, I remember Nasser. Yeah, I remember John Kleiner. I was, I was, I was, he was a I great was, guy. I love yeah, John Kleiner. Yeah, so. lovely human being. Great. Yeah. Guy. Great guy. So anyway, so well, thank so, you for. Yeah, so Mazda too. So, uh, and Mo also has a, a distinct collection of uh, automobiles where he keeps. It seems like all over the country. I'm not sure exactly where some of those things are, but uh, I want to. I want to hear about those. Yeah, I yeah. About his well, we're going to hear about everything. Yeah, so we so, can uh, preface it by saying I pretty much collect cars, bikes, and stray animals. Uh, that's about it. Uh, zero fashion <laughs> sense, no real family, and other than that, a very unbalanced life, having been in the industry for about 20 years. But it's been a hoot. <laughs> so wait, no, no, no real life, no fashion sense. Is that why you chose not to be on camera today? Ah, oh, there's the reason. Yes, you guys, That's it. You guys, you guys don't even want to see what I'm what I'm wearing. It's uh, I'm here in uh, Plano, Texas. I have been a, uh, now day four without working air conditioning, oh. uh, and it's 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 not pretty out here. So yeah, my air conditioning. Uh, we we get we bet we get weather out here that's kind of like biblical, and so the last storm <laughs> for whatever reason the house flickered. Something happened to the air conditioning, and now I'm just walking around in a wet towel. So. Oh, oh, okay. Well, uh, we, we, I'm glad there's no visual of that. So anyways, um, so Mo, welcome to the show. And uh, I guess I just, my first question to you is going to be, um, uh, uh, how did you get into the industry? What was your first gig in the industry? Was it straight out of college? And did you always, were you always a car enthusiast? Uh, well, I was, I've always been, I would say as much as I can remember, I had a brother that was a musician. And he, we have a great relationship. We ever actually never really fought. And I think part of the reason was, is it was like a conscious decision that he was going to be in a music and he was like little man getting to something else. Uh, so we don't end up being competitive. And it was, I, I want to say that was a conscious deal, but I wasn't that crazy into uh, staying up night and, and playing next to the radio. So I would, uh, I would read magazines. I would read magazines voraciously, uh, Car and Drivers, uh, Motor Trends, the early ones, and then more of the pointed enthusiast magazines for the different sex. So, and that was probably when I was like nine, ten, 
and then it and then it turned into box of magazines and still kind of a magazine hoarder but I, I i did like publications and kind of how they brought them brought them to life so that was probably how it started as a genesis in the childhood and then the thing that messed me up shortly after that was getting into scale models and radio control cars which almost made real cars seem more accessible because now you knew how the things worked especially for those especially the japanese models so there's kind of a connection between japanese radio control cars and affinity for that and then later older japanese cars and then uh Industry-wise, I, I, I got out of college, bummed around, uh, believe it or not, sold annuities, sold women's shoes, sold Foot Locker. <laughs> like, it was tough coming out of college. And then uh, had a few jobs that uh, leveraged part sales for bottle inspection equipment and then found myself into an export freight forwarder gig that was doing automotive parts. And because I kind of knew my way around a car that was – that gave me some facility for that. And then uh, from then on, actually got into it. I worked with a guy you might know, John Wong, Johnny Wong, who was at Super Street forever. Oh, yeah, yeah. And of course. Yeah, yeah. Johnny Wong and I worked at the same exports, uh, interna- it's called Exports <laughs> International, it was Gardena. <laughs> oh, wow. We worked at the same joint. And I was, I was there when uh, Johnny Wong turned 21 and just, he, he, it was the worst day of work he, I've ever seen a human being endure. Whoever his friends were, they took him out to the woodshed, and the guy was just green. And uh, I think I think his departure story was amazing to me because he'd gotten while we were working there through some connections he had because Johnny was involved in the car scene. He got a job through Matt Pearson at Super Street, mm-hmm. and then of course later on I kept in touch with Johnny. And uh, then. Uh, that, that day he turned green, I think might have been his last day of work. I think he just took off at lunch and never came back. But um, he's the guy that connected me with Super Street, and that's how I got into the magazine side through through Johnny Wong. So in, in a way, this is all his fault. Hey, so you were at Super Street for how long? Uh, I'm getting my – maybe like uh, 99 to 2000. It was, about, yeah, it was a couple of years. Uh, I was there during the Rich Chang era, pre Naderi. Oh, you right before John, John and Derry. So. Okay, so yeah, you, yeah, yeah. So what was your what was so your Matt, official title Matt, in your uh, in your role uh, there? I don't know. I was I was actually <laughs> all I remember my time there. I was I think it was like technical editor, but probably I think p- from a personal level, like at least at least the chief pervert. It was always Johnny and I kind of vying for that. So well, everyone we were trying to we were, we were perverts, we, man. <laughs> yeah. So no. So it's it's no small feat. Uh, it's no. You really have to bring your deviant game together actually to to kind of represent there. It was a tough crowd, tough young crowd, but. Uh, Matt Pearson built a really nice product there. Matt at the time had just moved on to Honda uh, to get a grown-up job where he had to wear pants. And then uh, it was Rich Chang. Uh, and uh, and then shortly you know, after that, did that for a few years. And that really was actually, in hindsight, a nice time. A lot of those guys went on to other things. And, and uh, certainly after that, I, uh, I went to go work. Once I start, I wanted to take my turn at adulting and wearing pants i went to go work for an agency that worked for mitsubishi and that's kind of how it started so that probably been 2001 okay so you were at mitsubishi during the heyday uh their paris the dakar days their mitsubishi evo yeah. the eclipse i mean um tell me some about the, some of the memorable cars and memorable events maybe you were uh uh while you were at mitsubishi because you were at mitsubishi for how many years uh, I was actually Mitsubishi twice. That time I was there for three years. Then Is that the first time? I went to four. Yeah, the first time. The first time around, I was there for three years. So I can talk about that. That was fun because the on on paper the brand was doing great. They were selling a ton of cars, zero zero zero. And of course, once once the paper oh, the came, zero, to zero, 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 interesting because of the four car companies i've been to and i think consumers don't aren't totally able to appreciate this each of them doesn't just represent a car it represents a unique culture that produces a car like the the final product of toyota is indicative of the culture final product of mitsubishi is very indicative of the culture you know a lot of brainiacs and aerospace guys and crazy ideas i i I would say as much as they try to toyota could never build an evo and as much as toyota would try 
they could probably never, you know, build a, a, a really bad Diamante. So there's, there's something to be said for both of what the culture can do. Uh, so wait, what, what do you likewise, say the Mitsubishi before. culture was then? The Mitsubishi culture at that time was a, it was a challenger brand. Remember, they were a larger brand name in, in Japan, and uh, they were dealing with various suppliers that were Mitsubishi companies trying to produce an end product that was a Mitsubishi finished good. So they would leverage, I mean, those, they had guys doing rockets and airplanes and all kinds of oh, stuff yeah, like Mitsubishi that. Not that that many into everything and heavy industry and not that that was mitsubishi automotive right but there were clearly heavy. parts of that that per permeated the culture they were very much into technology levering technology there's some things that you look back and like how how the hell did 3000 gt vr4 ever happen admittedly it was heavy as hell but there's more gizmos bells whistles that was a car uh, ahead of its time things. man i love that car it, it was, it was, and that was from a little, a little upstart company, it, and it really had that sort of challenger brand spirit to it. Uh, like, likewise, something that they would do, uh, you know, they they had a tremendous amount of success, as you know, in Paris to Dakar, and their off-road program, uh, and those are frankly some amazing Pajeros. I say I've seen some articles on them, and I remember them. If if anyone can lay their hands on a Pajero Evolution. Uh, from the 97 era that is a that is a ready to go race truck that maybe i don't know if the world has really seen that yet i know raptors and stuff get a lot of hype and that's a great truck but this thing was way ahead of its time it's funny if, you, if know, you ever get a chance go ahead go i'm sorry mo go ahead uh, i'll let you finish yeah, yeah if you ever get a chance to check out a, a page evo as we call it uh, certainly a, a completely unheralded, uh, not really known of vehicle, but a, a, amazing if you consider what the company was against at the time. This was also a company that brought out gasoline direct injection way ahead of a lot of other people. So there was a, there was sort of a commitment to, to innovate at Mitsubishi, whether it necessarily worked as good as it should have or not, if you follow me. So yeah. That was part but, of it. Uh, it's funny, your, um, uh, your, your, you know, your, uh, your Spanish heritage or your South American heritage comes out because I think you're Peruvian uh, by, you know, by blood. And uh, in Japan, yeah. we call that the Pajero, but you were calling it the Pajero. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. I well, like it, the, the other Pajero. thing, and in, in obviously, if you know Spanish, you know that's a dirty word in Spanish, too. So that's why in North America. I wouldn't know. I don't know dirty words in English, so I mean, I, I wouldn't know that. But, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's a good one. It's, it's, pretty, it's pretty much the equivalent of saying wanker. Oh really? I didn't know. So, that. Okay. Did you not know yeah. that, Sam? Yeah. I did. Uh, I did uh, not know that. I did not know that. Pajero. That's uh, that's why it's called Shogun in the UK. Oh, is that right, James? Correct. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, well, wasn't it a, uh, so, yeah, a Montero when it first came out in the yeah, US? It's Montero in the US. Yeah, yeah. they didn't call it. The yeah, Montero in the Montero in the US. So that you know, great, great, uh, great sort of name checking. But no, that no, Mitsubishi was a was a really interesting company. Uh, uh, lots of uh, lots of great ideas. Uh, lots of energy. Um, yeah, I know. I look I look back fondly at that time, actually. So now we're on the, the subject of Mitsubishi's. Then uh, let's go to James first. James, uh, give me your favorite Mitsubishi vehicle ever. Ooh, my you favorite could Mitsubishi. You could give me two. You could give me two if there's, or three if there's, uh, you know, but no more than three. But if you're, uh, if if you know, if there's some that are right on the edge. But uh, well, I, I do have to say I, I like the the Evo Nine because it had the lovely Recaro seats. Yeah, that yeah, was yeah. A, a a very good one. But I do really like the um, styling of the number three, the Evo Three. I think was my my favorite looking one. Mm -hmm. um, so when it comes to the Evo. Um, and then what is the uh, FTV, I think, is the unheralded one that doesn't get enough press. And I like the best, uh, the two-door uh, two small coupe that they did. In, oh, um, wait, wait. Uh, no, uh, what was that called? It was called the uh, FTV. Was it Wasn't v, it? v in yeah. But for us, it was, uh, or for Japan, FT, FTO. It, it, was, FT, it was actually yeah. the FTO. Sorry, the FTO. FTO, yeah. That's right, FTO. I was getting it wrong. The FTO, yeah, yeah. that was FTO. my one that I liked. Oh, that's a really pretty car. It's so small. I wish they would have... Uh, 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 sold it here. So, Tara, yes. what, uh, what about you? Um, I've, I've got a couple, I guess. Um, I used to own a, a Pajero um, in Japan? J, in J Top. 
It's, it was called a Pajero J top. It's a short body one with a convertible back end. <laughs> really short body one. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah that it, really small, the two door one, right? It looked like a, it looked like one of those Japanese Chorokus, you know, because yeah. it's like a yeah. Pajero Thank smashed you. into hey, it. Hey, like hey, a, hey Taro, if you have a, if you could, uh, if you find a picture of it, you could throw it up on a, uh, on your screen. I'm not even gonna try to do that, Sam. We got this wire. <laughs> You got this wirecast thing working. Oh, really? I'm not. Oh, I'm not touching it might, my computer. It might, it might screw everything. Oh. <laughs> James can do it if he wants to, but I'm not. I'm not touching. Well, James, uh, you can put up the FTO. <laughs> yeah, everyone. That is a really pretty car. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I've got. So yeah. So the Pajero is is you know I like it. You know, there's I have a, a, a soft spot for it. Um, what else? Um, Evo. Yeah, Evo, no, Evo 9. Cars. Yeah, Evo 9. I mean, oh, I like Evo is. 2 as well. That. that is a pretty car even now, like the white one down there. It's... Oh, there's the uh, Evo, Evo 9 Evo as well. Evo 9, yeah yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Evo 9 might be my yeah. favorite. Really? I would have to yeah. go with a 3000 GT, believe it or not, because we had one at Road and Track for a year. We had a uh, long-term one. And uh, yeah, I drove a lot. Uh, and it was just fantastic. And as Mo said, it was heavier than sh crap. It, it was... Uh, you know, I mean, it's just like this Mitsubishi should, has no business building this car, but man, it was fun. And it was called the GTO in, uh, mm -hmm. Japan. in Japan. Yeah, but they, you know, they couldn't call it here because uh, the Ferrari and those guys had that thing. So, okay, so now, Mo, I was uh, saving best for last for someone who worked at Mitsubishi. Which car would you, uh, would you, would you want in your, in your 20 car garage from Mitsubishi? Uh, Boy, that's that's a tall order. I mean, I'll, there, there's there's a lot of weirder ones. There's a, the Galant VR4 that we got in the United States, but in Japan, and it's called the ST generation. The Galant that came after that one was available uh, with Evo style gear and a 2.5 liter V6 turbo was in this Japan. The one, was Probably this the one that, one. that was this the WRC car before the uh, Evo? No, no. This oh, okay. is this was this was. This was a weirder, bigger car. It's almost it would almost okay, be okay. like the, the 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 car that would have preceded the Mazda six in size. Uh the Mazda six speed. You you, six you would size. pick this over but, an Evo or a three thousand GT or a Pajero Evo? Are you kidding me? It's a great sleeper yeah. car to go in, Sam. Hey, I'm telling you, Mo yeah. has the most eclectic taste in cars. <laughs> so <laughs> so bunch this of, is a bunch of junk. I said you want you want you want the you want with different car. Yeah, I know. I, I like I like the different cars, and yeah, I, don't get me wrong. I love Evo. Was it was actually one of the nicer points of the PR career to launch Evo. I don't recall Sam if you were on the maybe semi legendary Thailand launch trip for the U.S. media. Were, were you on that trip? Which trip? For the launch of when when Evo came to the United States. Uh, I remember Dick Kelly at the time, who was the PR director in Mitsubishi, that we they did the launch of that car in Pattaya. Uh, oh Thailand. yeah, I went to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was there. That was a great trip. <laughs> yeah, you trip. were there. I, I was there. Asami I remember. and everyone. Yeah, that was an awesome trip. Yeah. So, so oh yeah, June Asami. So so much yeah. so much of that trip that we we can't share with with the uh, with the people listening. But it was an amazing trip in the proper uh, I, I way to actually. I don't know what you're talking about. But, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, was, but yeah, that was, was a fun trip. There was a. I, you, there was a small racetrack on Pattaya over there, which I couldn't believe. It was a go, it was a oh, go kart. It was a go, was it a go, go kart. kart yeah, I remember yeah, we, it was small. Yeah. yeah, we we so. we drove the tires off of that for like in like ninety degree heat for like a whole day. Oh yeah, yeah. And you know what? One thing yeah. I, I I remember about that trip is every meal we had was something like, you know, spaghetti or you know like sandwiches. I'm going, dude, uh, we're in Thailand. Do you guys are you guys planning to serve Thai food? They go. No, we we don't think you guys would like it. I go, oh my god! What are they, you know, no, we we did we we did that one we, time. I had to go remember to a cafeteria they, with the dude, so. No, they we stopped at some roadside place. That yes, our yes, found because I like forced you, I forced everyone to. So, anyways, always yeah, Samatani, always uh, Samatani, forcing exactly. everyone to do something. <laughs> so, so, so many of the and and to put this in perspective, this was December of two thousand two. Oh, yeah. So, like, so, I have hot. I have San. I have Sam to thank for that hemorrhoid that that meal gave me. So thank you, Sam. That was a rare, a rare privilege. But yeah, that was that was an amazingly spicy meal, as I recall. Amazing. So oh, okay. no, good good time, good good trip. It was a really good trip. Okay, I think we lost Taro's um, um, audio, huh, Taro? 
Yeah, you guys can hear me, but apparently the uh, audience can't hear me. Okay. Do you have so, a do you, do you have a notebook and sign that you could put up? <laughs> you know. I mean, yeah. Just just go ahead. I'll I'll oh, just I'll okay. just I'll well, just. Uh, all right. So Mo, we're um, recording it. So we're recording it. Mo, so we can, uh, yeah. off to going to uh, after your Mitsubishi, we had a uh, slight uh, stint at Ford, a very short one. Yeah. Well, what and what did yeah, you that was, what did you do good. there? Uh, I worked for John Kleinert in the Western region. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. Just, what uh, what cars did you were, were you uh, uh, associated with there? Oh, I mean, dude, the two big two biggest ones that come to mind. There was a bunch that I frankly don't want to remember, like maybe Freestyle and uh, the sedan related to Freestyle. Okay. Uh, but the the two that the two that stick out, uh, man, that, that Ford GT uh, in that Super Bowl ad, and then we had a Ford GT in town. And we would just book people in hour after hour. And then that was also the relaunch of SN197 Mustang. So that was huge. I've actually never seen a launch quite. I mean, nothing I've seen is still as big of, of a, uh, as a, a launch of a Mustang. I mean, maybe not even Camry, but to be honest, you, man, as far so, as what you, what you do in the media. But if you were there during the launch of the 4 GT, what a time to be there, huh? I mean, geez, that is, you know. Well, yeah, it was, uh, it was an amazing took- car. Mo, remember when we took the Ford GT to Willow Springs? Yes. <laughs> my my so virtual background. Was, <laughs> yes, yes. That that thing is a that thing was a hoot. And I, I will say of all the of all the press cars that I've ever handled or dealt with, I have never seen a car beaten so mercilessly, <laughs> brutalized by media, and not miss a beat. Like oh, that that's... thing just needed tires. The thing was that thing is so They're overbuilt so the engine so yeah. under stress yeah yeah those are and who knew it's so crazy because they had trouble you know with selling the last few and uh the program you know depending on who you talk to from the sense of internal politics might have been something that that uh you know uh spelled the fate for svt and things like that there was a lot going on with svt but certainly i think it's uh, impressive that chris theodore and john coletti put that car together and how it's standing the test of time and just uh it just gets more and more special that particular car so you're telling me once you uh, you guys launched the ford gt and that mustang you said okay i think i peaked at ford and i'm out of here is that pretty much it? <laughs> no no i i didn't i didn't uh, i didn't think i peaked that was actually a tough spot because that was a really good gang of people that was uh i wasn't i wasn't sure i want to leave what it came down to was like Okay, here's this idea of regional managership. And then at Nissan, I got the opportunity to succeed another really great uh, automotive PR guy, Dean Case, uh, who was working for Tim Gallagher. And then working right. for Tim Gallagher was 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 uh, challenging, but I always called Tim like the, the, the big brain. He was able to sort of think and do strategy and do messaging. Dude, there's still stuff I pull from the Tim Gallagher playbook this many years later. Yeah, so I'm, I think that so I still keep brief... in touch with that guy. So he's uh, yeah. he's still yeah. the same. He hasn't changed a bit. So yeah, he's he's kind he's kind of he's kind of uh, you know can can be fiery, can be passionate, can be angry, but very 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 intelligent. Good good uh, a oh, good yeah. head on him. Oh so. yeah yeah. And he uh, he he uh, he was your predecessor at Mitsubishi. You know he was at Mitsubishi before he was at. Yes, yeah. he he was Mitsubishi. Years. He set that he set that yeah he set that shop up back when he was at Ruder Finn, their first yeah. agency, like eons ago. I remember right. going through through cl- closets and finding ancient Tim Gallagher authored uh, press kits back when they were in binders. It was it was amazing. So um, then you, then you, uh, you was it back? It was back to Mitsubishi, and then it was to Nissan, correct? Or was it, do I have it the other way around? No, no. I went to I went to Nissan from Ford. Oh, okay. uh, Nissan to, to be to, 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 Nissan to be clear. Uh, one one of my favorite brands. I've been a Z car guy uh, forever in a day. I still have a five ten and a Z. Um, big fan of that brand. So it was kind of it felt really good to me to be there, uh, just because it was you know something I'd already always felt inside, but. Uh, Nissan decided to go to Tennessee, and I wasn't ready to leave California then. And so I got uh, a, the call, a call uh, from uh, from Mitsubishi to, to Janice Little to see, hey, do you want to come back? And I jumped at it because I wanted to, you know, pretty much stay in California doing PR. And that was when, turns out, they were ramping up to launch the Evo 10. Yeah, which was a great car. Uh, 
totally reimagined yeah. uh, with uh, remember Hiroshi Fuji. Uh, Dr. Yeah. Evil. Yeah. So he was, I still keep yeah. in touch with him. He's in China now uh, working on like engineering stuff. So, um, uh, oh, really? And, yeah, he is. And then um, uh, after Mitsubishi, your, um, uh, um, your, your travels took you to yes. Toyota uh, Lexus, October where 20, you are now. 2011. Yeah, October 2011th, I, uh, I, I left Mitsubishi. And the, to be clear, Mitsubishi had some momentum with that that new Lancer body and a few few yeah, other plans and then not of course, really, not like, really Mitsubishi was just they were they were not <laughs> they were kind of digging their own grave a little slowly and slowly 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 2009 and, and what what the Japanese call the Lehman shock is what dimmed the light you would have needed the market to continue growing and of course it not only did it grow, not grow it contracted like no one else could have imagined well so, you know I who mean, knows? They, killed, they killed all their fun cars and they you know they, they had to well i they, mean they had no, they had no yeah i mean they and, were you know doing some they, they i everyone said this about mitsubishi in japan too i think me and taro even said this they're really they're 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 wonderful they're great at building cars they're just really bad at selling them you know so terrible have no and, and sense, you know so and nothing nothing could be the polar opposite to that than say toyota, toyota who is, well they do build good cars too but yeah but they, no no the market the mark the marketing is definitely there yeah sort well, of the marketing well, toyota knows how, yeah stuff. toyota knows how to sell cars so so um so that, but the biggest so, difference. yeah so you got you in a, in a way you went from one end of the spectrum to the other right Kind totally of. and uh yeah. and did you did you when you got to toyota did you find yourself in this amazing um, um corporate paradise where everything functioned like clockwork you know they're the biggest country uh, biggest company in the world you know um uh, uh short short answer is no okay uh, but, we, but, but you know what let's just keep it with the short answer because i don't want you i want akio calling you on the phone going i heard that podcast and uh because akio is one of our biggest it, listeners and biggest he is followers one of our biggest listeners. Him i mean he sends us he sends me emails his, constantly about things i need to talk about doesn't, him up he call, you, Sam. doesn't he call you jimmy i mean he does he calls me yeah. jimmy m jimmy m akio <laughs> here the, the, that's right so no but, I got I got indoctrinated in the Toyota way, and it's a very successful company. And that's kind of when you talk about cultures. Toyota is the ultimate, and been most successful with a focus on process, and sort of the process for them is the sort of the goose that laid the golden egg. Uh, a genius manufacturing engineering culture, genius at it, maybe, maybe still the best at it in many ways. So it was it was different versus manufacturing engineering versus sort of the the purely risky, you know, interesting engineering at Mitsubishi, they 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 couldn't be more different. Probably maybe Honda's someplace in the in the middle, uh, you All know, right. between balancing both both because it's still a brilliant engineering, maybe this now the most brilliant engineering company with, you know, some of a, a great deal of the manufacturing chops Toyota has. But you know, Toyota's Toyota's a beast still. Oh, I mean, it is they're a beast. really really they're a really impressive company. And I think culturally it took me a few years just to find my way there so i i came in i was doing you know the toyota and toyota pr and really sort of having to learn a lot of the way that they do things over there uh which was different and then 2014 moved over to lexus uh did lexus usa pr and now do uh, lexus pr globally uh and it's been it's awesome. been a hell of a ride very very interesting company wow you have had quite the career already and you're still like i think you're in your 40s still aren't you I'm 47. Yeah. yeah. Oh, get, oh, we're kind of getting getting to the end of that. Get, get, Anyways, you get to the uh, end of that. Yeah, I'm not deep in my 40s. All right, so Mo, <laughs> go ahead and put on your um, uh, corporate cap now. So I'm going to open it up to Taro and James too. But I'd like to just ask you some questions about the, um, uh, you know, just Lexus and the industry and uh, and yeah, you know, sure. it, wh whatever you can't, whatever you can't share with us, you know, you. Uh, I was I was waiting you know. for Mo to start talking about the Cabo trip that we. That we did it. Uh, well, we're not going to raise that. Our, no gonna, gonna, oh, that was another one. one. I, heard, one I died forgot about it. Dude, if there's ever, if there was ever a vehicle that needed Cabo, it was Outlander Sport. Oh, I didn't go to that <laughs> yeah. one just because it was the Outlander Sport, probably. So. Dude, it, 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 it had like it had like a caravan down there as well. We like we like drove down with with Roger and I. Oh, that was a hoot. Yeah, so, that anyways, was, that was a fun trip. I loved that trip so much. I bought one. <laughs> no, you had an Outlander, not an Outlander Sport. 
I had an Outlander, Outlander GT. Out. Yeah, yeah. We had we had Outlander yeah. GTs oh, that, down there too. Actually, yeah, that's, yeah, that's true. We did. That's actually good. that was a good little SUV at the time. For sure. Oh, it's yeah. a great car. So, Mo, uh, where do you see yeah. the um, uh, where do you see our cars? You know, you, we're in the middle of this coronavirus, which probably put a lot of things on hold. I mean, factories were shut down. Yeah. And everything. Um, uh, do you are you guys getting back up to speed soon? Factories opening. Uh, slowly. Be I mean, I mean, factories are starting to move. Obviously, something that's going to be affected by that is demand. And I said globally, you've seen China rebound the quickest. Uh, strangely enough for Lexus, if you look at it, China, I think may have posted one of their best, if not the best month ever coming out of coronavirus from past I hear, demand. I heard that last month, right? Oh. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So I don't think it's the same globally. Everyone's sort of feeling this crisis globally. Uh, and I think the bigger picture, which no one can answer, no one has a crystal ball, is how, to what level will demand uh, reemerge? Because you've got the economy globally really affected, uh, uh, you know, especially in the United States, which is kind of one of the global economic engines, a very, very high rate of unemployment that's going to affect uh, Huge spending. Huge rate of unemployment. We're talking, you know, yeah. Yeah. so we're talking so, yeah. so, great so, depression so, levels. Yeah, yeah. So who who knows what happens with the, the car industry? I mean, to be clear, we have to we have to accept that at this point, the car industry is certainly st still strong, but a legacy industry. Uh, it's, it was dealing with changes in society even prior to coronavirus, uh, ride sharing, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the emphasis on a car as a, as a, a rite of passage or reward is something that would kind of been changing or shifting with the newer generation of buyers. So there was a lot that's been, that was going on to be clear before coronavirus. And I think that might've accelerated things. I'm not even going to speculate of the, of the, you know, future of who who's going to survive, who's going to contract, who's going to grow. I don't really see a tremendous amount of growth in the automotive industry, and I don't. I would I would challenge the people that do, at least in the near term, certainly for the next eighteen months. Uh, it's going to take a while for all of this to shake out, and I think we're all just kind of watching and and waiting and hoping, uh, like like just about so many other industries in the in the in the world. Uh, you know, it's not like gaming or something else that's going to be able to benefit from this crisis. Uh, certainly, you know, I don't want to paint the, the, a, a picture of massive doom and gloom uh, for the automotive industry. We're, we're not the movie theater industry, uh, but certainly oh, well, things, things were, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Think, things were, ch things were changing and shifting into a newer competitive landscape prior to this in terms of uh, sort of buyer, uh, buyer incentive and, and what drove consumers. And the psychographic was changing, but this ex certainly has accelerated things. I mean, I can't. I'm having a hard time accepting that. I, 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 at the tail end of this, or coming out of this, I'm going to be living in a world without curry house and uh, and soup plantation. Yeah. I go, what? what uh, I heard about soup plantation. Curry house got it too. Oh, curry house curry, did before the coronavirus. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was before. Yeah. Exactly. yeah that was even, but still, there's not going to be one. So, so anyways, uh, do, Mo, what kind? Which Lexus models are uh, selling uh, well for you guys? And uh, any uh, that um, that might yeah, what are you, we might yeah, what are you see working that are right gone, now? you know, yeah. if you could say anything about them. Uh, well, I mean, I think you guys know that uh, uh, GS will be going away. Uh, I think that was in, that was obviously in the news. That our our midsize sedan our demand for Lexus really has stemmed uh, hard on the crossovers. The SUVs uh, remains pretty high. It's going to be a Although crossover ES company, is, you know. I, I think there are going to be a few luxury companies that are crossover companies, but yeah. that existed before Corona, to be clear. I mean, demand, as you guys have seen, right. shifted. Right, GS was on the chopping block for a while, I heard, too. Yeah, and, 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 and was already stopped, already stopped being sold in some of the other global markets. Right. ES, believe it or not, uh, remains strong. I think yeah. they kind of I see found, a, of found a, sweet, a, a sweet spot with the last ES. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, de definitely more crossover demand, more technology. Uh, you, you'll be seeing, you know, the brand's proliferation of uh, different drivetrains, uh, you know, beyond just hybrid and gasoline and within the next few years. So there's some exciting things to look for. Uh, it's just a matter of, you know, trying to see what that market's going to look at look like. I mean, if, if you're talking about, you know, um, other F cars, additional F cars, I mean, that's that all remains to be seen. Like uh, the LCF, you know, maybe? Um, no who comment. knows? 
but uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but 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 I, I mean, you have to remember those are kind of driven as sort of brand elevating tools, and the and the meat and potatoes of the volume is going to remain crossovers for a while. Okay, all right, but what we we will see, we will continue to see uh, um, interesting and nice, exciting cars from Lexus. Yeah, you're you're gonna you're gonna see one as future. soon as in I think June ninth, June tenth is gonna be the 10th, global debut. Of, yeah, yeah, actually June ninth in the United States, but uh, be the global debut of the next generation uh, sports sedan, the IS. Oh, the IS, yeah, that's oh. gonna be great. It has, is the IS a good seller? That's really been one of my, you know, a, a really favorite car of mine. I even like the new one. Uh, you know, once they got rid of the V6, uh, the small V, the 2.5 liter, I think. It, now they got, you know, it's the uh, 2.0 turbocharged. But it's a great car. Yeah. Uh, is that doing well? I would hate to see that car, you know, go. No, I mean, it's it's been, it's been it's doing strong enough that we're obviously going to renew it. So I think you'll, you'll be pleasantly surprised with what you see and what's been done with it uh, when it debuts here at the beginning of June. Oh, I'm looking forward to it. And speaking of IS, you uh, you you uh, recently purchased an old uh, Aristo original IS uh, in the U.S. Then well, no, uh, Aristo is the uh, the GS. Oh no, the, uh, not the Aristo. Uh, wait, what was it called? In, uh, Alteza. 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 I'm getting all my. Yeah, it starts with an A too. So yeah, the Alteza. I mean, um, great car because I remember it. And I was one of the first to drive it because we, you know, we had one in road and track really early. It had the uh, chronograph um, sports gauge. It came in a manual transmission. Uh, I think it was a straight six, wasn't it? Yeah, it is. It was the it's the three liter, the two JZ uh, non non twin non twin turbo, turbo like the yeah. super motor, but so still, it, still it solid internal. Great car. Uh, yeah, you know, nice and car. I it they, good. they go. They, they go really high mileage. Uh, they make great drivers if you can pick them up on used uh, markets. It's a pretty serviceable chassis. I mean, as mm -hmm. far as tuning and things like that. I mean, I, yeah, I, I, I like that car a lot, obviously. Yeah. Um, hey, James, but, is there a yeah. shot of the uh, uh, chronograph uh, instrument cluster? That would be great. Because, you know, uh, they, yeah, I, I wish they continued that. A lot of people, there it is. A lot of people complained yeah. about this thing because they go, dude, it's hard to read. I go, it's cool, man. You know, you don't see anything like it. But how many miles does it yours was, have? It on was it? unique. Uh, many. I think it was like, it's like 124. Oh, that's uh, low. And, and, that's uh, low for a Toyota. That thing's got 300,000. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's now, now it's got the drivetrain from a 2004 GTO in it. So a little bit of a oh, little really? bit of a, of a Frankenstein, yeah, yeah, a little bit of a Frankenstein project. And it's a manual, so, right? Yeah, yeah, still a man, six-speed manual, but the okay. uh, the original drivetrain was manual. So. so can you quickly go through uh, the cars you currently own? Oh, because I'm a hoarder. You're yes. gonna, you want to out me as a hoarder? Okay. Yes, <laughs> so, yes, yes. Hey, uh, I rather see people hoarding to uh, um, um, cars than toilet paper. All right, so. Okay, in very in various states of of uh, disrepair, of, uh, completion completion <laughs> okay. or disrepair. Here right. here's what I have. I'll start with the the Porsches. So there's a 944 Turbo. That's Whoa. an 88 Turbo S. That's yeah, a great and, car. Yeah, and a, nine, a 968. You have a 968 then, also. They're yeah, I do. Kind of the same uh, size, two, same you know. One big difference: one's built by Audi, one's built by Porsche. That's, okay, one's that's a Zoop and okay, so, Yeah, okay, okay, okay. So, okay, okay. And and okay. The, and then that's where the differences stop because I will tell anyone that's looking at both go for the 944 Turbo because of the parts and availability really? on 960. Brutal, brutal. Really? <laughs> so, oh my God, that's dude, surprising like, to hear because I would have picked the 968 all day over the 944, even though I like well, the 944. Yeah, hope, hope, hope. Hope you don't need a Vario cam solenoid, Holmes, because that'll be like twenty five hundred if you can find one. <laughs> wow, <laughs> that's a drag. Uh, at least you have the nine forty four, not the nine twenty four. Oh my God, nine twenty four was just yeah, yeah. Then okay, I, then I got some old old Japanese. I have uh, a five ten, which just got repainted Porsche Aga Blue, and then a two forty Z, which is the car I've actually had the longest for like predates my Super Street days. Uh, and then I'm blanking out, obviously, see, have, is it with uh, the flip up lights and all that, the S12 or something, was it? No, no, it's just, a, I actually have the, the, the really hard to find, uh, JDM Nismo plexiglass covers with the steel ring, the chrome okay. ring uh, you, on, the, on the front. 
just just because you brought that up, Mo, I just got to say my my segment after uh, uh, your interview will be uh, um, uh, just kind of uh, reporting on the rumors that Nissan may be bringing the Sylvia back. So that would be great. Love love the Sylvia. It would that be would the, be an the S16. S16. But I'll, yeah. I'll give you all I know after the segment. So anyway, so that's my little trailer. So, so what do you what do you have, Mo? S13. I have an S13, yeah. I have an S13, and uh, that's got had a bunch of stuff done to it. And um, I have one Honda left, that's a '91 uh, Civic SI. Uh, and then I Holy get to the cars God. I have. Here. And look at James. I have go. Two, R- <laughs> I love it, two James. RX7. I have one RX7 with an LS1 RX7 that's got a Borg Warner turbo on a, on a, on a rotary. That's obviously. So wait, which one? The F, uh, do you have the uh... FD, FD, both both FD3s. Yeah. And then uh, wow, one Mer- Mercedes 500e, which you knew about. Oh yeah, and I then know one car. one BMW uh, 1991 850 V12 manual. Uh, don't get those. Uh, oh, don't wait, get those. You have don't an 850. Those. Yeah, it's a beautiful yeah. car. Don't get it. Why not? Yeah, money pit. Um, <laughs> well, it is. I mean, it's it, it's it was like probably the one of the most expensive sports coupes on the market when it came out. You know. Oh yeah, yeah. And fixing it, the same same category as nine six eight. And everyone will tell you that. Everyone told me I didn't listen. Okay. But uh, your beautiful car. I mean, when you have it working, honestly, a, a fantastic GT. Even to this day, like yeah, that car is kind of mind blowing. Driving that car. And, and, and how well it works, and the and the manual is. It's that's the thing, man. The manual's great. I, I'm hoping they come uh, and, up with another car like this, even though they did have the i8. But you know, this thing is. Yeah. yeah. Okay, keep going. And then I still, I still oh, have the 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 E46 M3 competition, then Ooh, a 1992 a... JD, JDM MR2 Turbo. So I do have a Toyota. Ooh, there you go. My only Toyota. Oh, no, wait, I have, hold on, I have another Toyota. 1976 Corolla, Corolla Celica Liftback. Which I just picked up, but I got it. I found a the guy. One that looks like a fire. cockroach. Was that the one? No, the one that looks like a, like a Mach one. But a guy had oh, it. Oh, that one. Yeah, I like that one too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. With, yeah. With, the, with the you put a beams motor in that. That's kind of nice. So I I got suckered into that. Uh, and then I think <laughs> I'm onto the I'm onto the American stuff, which is a '69 GTO and a '67 Cougar. You have a '69 uh, GTO? Holy cow! Yeah. Man, I have, have a six hundred GTO. Like the Peruvian Jay it's Leno. Pe- my God! <laughs> it's no, no, not even. Oh no, no. Literally, I'm like, I'm like the, I'm like the Peruvian Chico and the Man. So it's like the, <laughs> oh, these are, the, the, no, these are better than Chico and the Man cars. So the the uh, the the, the, the GTO is getting it's got a crate motor uh, that needs to go in it. And yeah, this is this is guys. This is what happens when you you, you don't have kids, you don't have family, and and uh, you you do this stuff too long. So use yeah, me as a I cautionary tale. Yeah, I think I, I I was gonna say yeah, this would be hard to do with a a, a wife who uh, you know uh, has, <laughs> has has a better sense of you know the reality. <laughs> where, where, do you, I get uh, keep, where do you keep these cars? Good question. Where do you All keep these over. cars? All over the place. All over. There, yeah, there's there's storage for the ones I have here in Texas. Uh, mm-hmm. Here in Texas, I have the the RX sevens, one of the Porsches, the Mercedes, and the M three, and the R two. You, 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 you yeah. transported all those cars over there, huh? No, they kind of accumulated over here. Sam. Oh, I see. So, oh, okay. Tara, look outside your window. I'll bet you you'll see one of these cars <laughs> parked up. Yeah, the they're kind of all over. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. Apparently, it was. To, to be clear, to be clear, it was an issue I wanted to address in spring of this year, but some stuff happened. So yeah, if, okay, if any, if anything cool. else, they can they can be. Uh, I mean, I don't. I, I have a formula though. I try not to spend when I buy them more than ten thousand. It's very very rare, and then you try to have to have that forecast of can this thing appreciate to fifteen or twenty within a five to seven year window. Because frankly, the number of enthusiast cars that are out there is diminishing. And then once the yeah. publications jump on something, and they do jump on something, they're always looking for new cars to laud. And especially as manufacturers are building fewer and fewer, uh, let's just say, interesting or enthusiast cars, uh, some things that you know are are poised to become classic. I think I honestly think you know, um, MR2 uh, 
SW20 is still attainable at a very good price starting to climb up because you're starting to see people interest peak by the driving experience that thing offered. Uh, that That's one of them. And who would have thought any of that old, uh, you know, Japanese nostalgic car scene stuff would have picked up. I remember when I used to have like four or five tens, I didn't pay more than 500 bucks for any of them. And now look at that. Really? Like, oh, dude, dude, this was like nine. This is like the late 1990s. They were, they were all over the place. No one was crazy about them. Trust me. Well, look at the yeah. Supras. They're yeah, over like a hundred thousand dollars, you know, or whatever, like two hundred. Yeah, that, so that, crazy. that's crazy. And we've seen we've seen it happen before. I think when we get through the rose-colored glasses, if you've ever, if you've ever like, you know, Hemi Cuda, which back in the day was, you know, uh, this this muscle car, but it has these skyrocketing values and and certainly limited technology. Uh, there, we we have proven as a society that Americans will pay for nostalgia. Yeah, Ben Chu, uh, we had as a guest on our last podcast, and I think he, he, he hit it on the head when he says, you know, the baby boomers, you know, drove all those muscle cars up, but now it's us, the Met, or the Gen X people, our cars of our youth were those Supras, those Zs, you know, uh, yeah. the Mitsubishi, mm-hmm. and those, you know, the, those are the cars that are the uh, uh, auctioning off for a lot of money, and um, what, you see any of these, uh, any any cars these days that could that could be a hundred thousand, two hundred thousand dollar car in the next. Hmm, what are we talking? Thirty years? Forty years? Forty years? You'd have to talk like you'd have to talk like twenty to thirty years. Uh, I, I think would there's say 30 obviously to 40 years. Yeah. anything with like a homologation pedigree, you know. Oh, with the race. Subaru the race, STI, race, yeah, Evo, yeah. any of those. I mean, that's kind of a no brainer. Those are, yeah, those are going to be. They might go for a lot. Yeah. 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 Taro's, I mean, uh, Taro's it, little, it, it, uh, you know, semi convertible Pajero might. It certainly could, honestly. And any, any, um, you know, anything 911, but that's kind of a no-brainer. I think oh. you're trying to find the ones that are, that are a little weirder. Like I would look at something like, uh, you know, uh, FT86 BRZ and wonder could that do it? Because that's built in sufficient volume. Mm-hmm. And, and and to that matter, I only I only bring that car up because. I don't think anybody saw, you know, 89 to 94, 240 SX becoming what it became. They're not super expensive still, but they became so popular. Eventually when there's so few left, yeah, when there's so few left that aren't smashed to bits, it, it stands yeah. to reason that those are going to become somebody's nostalgia. Uh, so, mm-hmm. you, 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 you know, the point is you would look at something like the BRZ FT86, but that'll never do it. And it very well could. You have, you have no, no way of, no way of telling. And, and, you know, I think anything that is from the Japanese supercar era, which is, you know, Mitsubishi RX, the Mitsubishi 3000 GT, uh, the RX seven, the Supra, the 300 DX, uh, mm-hmm. the, the, uh, and the, dude, the, the NSX blown up. Well, NSX you is getting you can't, way up there. It's, it's getting out, yeah. of my, yeah. it's out of my price range now, you know? So, so yeah, no, can it's, you, it's out of a, Oh, go ahead. Hmm? It's out of a lot of people's price range. Yeah. Right? yeah. So uh, you know, please don't answer this if it's going to get you in trouble. But we heard rumors of um, uh, um, Toyota is hey, there's the LFA. I love that car. Uh, speaking out of price range, but uh, along the lines of this, um, so far it is the most expensive, most exotic, premium um, sports car ever to come out of Japan. The LFA, the Lexus LFA. But we're hearing um, uh, from Japan, little my little birdies out there that are saying. Toyota's working on a super super car that's going to even surpass that car, the LFA in price, in prestige, in power. You know, um, but again, those are rumors. Um, but I, and I know you can't say yes or no because it, Toyota hasn't come up with it. But um, would it be uh, wrong to say that uh, there's no way they're working on it, or is this something like you just don't know? Um, yeah, I, bet. I mean, I can't answer that. I think okay, most that's, of the nope, information. That, yeah, that's most, that's an answer most, in yeah. itself, Mo. Thank you very much. Yeah, most, <laughs> most, <laughs> most, of, the itself, buddy. <laughs> most of the information that comes out of Japan tends to come from publications uh, that are really, really are. good. At, yeah, so. yeah, and and Magazine X. We, we you know right. them. You know right. them well. You read Japanese and. 
And so, you know, uh, you, you know what their, what their batting average is. Yeah. So. Well, uh, most of the PR people that I ask questions like that, too, go, Sam, you probably know better than me. So, yeah, you know, just go with the information you have. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so. Yeah. So I, I will say that there's uh, the overall both Toyota, Lexus going forward, Lexus, where we're crafting, you know, sort of a, another cultural shift in terms of what we call Lexus driving signatures, something we're trying to develop, which is a unique signature uh, feeling for the car, meaning okay. dynamically a uniform style. Everyone, especially within the Toyota Cosmos, is trying to improve the drivability, the fun. The, kind of like what I BMW and Mercedes have done, because you really know what, yeah. you know, when you're driving those cars, you know what you're driving, so. Yeah, yeah it's, it's kind of a, a sort of a tactile identity, you would say, but something that connects with you. But I think Toyota, because of the way they've always been, you know, and now Lexus, I can speak to that side. You've always had this one reality where every chief engineer has the ultimate say on the car. And I yeah. think what we're looking at going forward, you instead of the chief engineer having the ultimate say, the culture is going to shift because you're going to build it to what maybe say, uh, you know, Koji Sato and Akio. A Toyota want to feel with the car right. so it's going to be a more uniform deal and that over that that doesn't sound like much but but over there that's a big cultural shift because oh, chief yeah. engineers typically yeah. are are, are, go, are gods and in, in terms of the the the, the finished product so right. I think you'll see that get better changing, huh? with, yeah well culture is changing but the thing is you you, you have to know uh, Akio is a huge huge car nut Oh yeah. So he he's, ultimately well, he's a master he's, driver he's, as they as their he's a, he their he call. he is a master driver. He is uh, you know pretty much where 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 we had Narusa on. This is sort of the yeah. spiritual successor to that. So he's mm -hmm. kind of picked picked that up and maybe taken upon himself to keep the enjoyment for driving going on to, within the Toyota. To, and you know Akio actually drives in the races like twenty four hour Nurburgring in those races. I, I you know I yeah. wonder there is no way a CEO of even a small much smaller company than Toyota would be allowed to go racing in a real race where there could be serious bodily injury. I, I just that just really blow blows my mind to even think of that now. No, man, and, How can the chief he lays, board he of lays Toyota let him get strapped into a race car? That's just crazy. It's pretty cool though. Uh, yeah, it's cool, but it's just something that you yeah. wonder you wonder the wisdom of it. I mean, dude, what if Yeah. You know, well, I mean, what if, what if, what if, um, 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 Carlos Ghosn, I'm using Carlos Ghosn now because he's, you know, he's a very controversial he's figure. He's disposable. He, yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, well, he pay, pays off something with someone when he's at Nissan to, you know, sideswipe to take a cue off the road. You know, I mean, geez, horrible. No, so, it's an, it's an I'm a novelist, deal, so that's why I'm thinking all these yeah. uh, crime it, angles. You, right, James? You, you, correct, Sam. You, you're you're right. Right. You like the crime angle. I get that, but I think you also understand the the within the culture of the respect and frankly the power and influence that he has that he can dictate this. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I guess yeah, I guess that shows him yeah, the power he has there. So okay, yeah. Mo, hey, thanks for uh, a great hour. Uh you were uh, very, very um uh, informative. Uh even the uh, questions you didn't answer, to me you answered. Um I could <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, um, uh, Taro and James, do you guys have anything for Mo? Um, Nothing from me, Mo. I think you gave it pretty clear there from Sam gave you the interrogation, so I don't want to lead on too much more than that. So I, I think that yeah. it's good for me. Once again, we'll just have to re reframe that as a no comment. Take it as you will. <laughs> well, I wish, and Mo, you can't see us, right? You're just on the phone, right? Yeah, I'm just not a Oh, I wish you could see my glasses. I mean, these glasses, they're making fun of my Mr. glasses. Mr. Steven these Seagal nice. in front of us, Mark. not Steven Seagal glasses. Steven oh, Seagal, eat your carrot. That's exactly what they are. Steven so, Seagal, eat your carrot. I can't see without them. So, and I'm stand, sitting way away from my monitor. Yeah, so, so once this what is are they, over. Are they like the, are like the, are they gargoyles? Just, what are you wearing? Just, just no, Google Steven Seagal no, eating a not. carrot. No, they don't. Google they don't Steven like... Seagal eating a carrot is, and you'll let's, see the glasses. Yeah, let's, let's wow. just do the make it easy for everyone here to make it. Uh... Oh, no, James is going to put it up. Well, sorry, you can't see this, Mo. But he no, can when he looks at it on the, on the uh, oh, when he, when he looks, revisits the after fact. Yeah. yeah. Well, you That's don't have I mean. to do this. Dude, I don't... Taro, do you, you have anything? I don't think you, you... 
You can't throw stones for fashion sense anymore, Sam. <laughs> I mean, look. <laughs> These are not even the close to being the same. They're, they're essentially they exactly the same I, thing. No, I mean, John, exactly John Davis nice agrees with this on Facebook, and that's the important These thing. Nice old yeah. yeah, look at the carrot one. It's exactly. Look, exactly it's how not it looks. exactly. It is. <laughs> it's, that's him. That's okay. it. So, uh, Tara, do you get back to back to point here? Tara, you have anything to? That's, I mean, that's that's um, basically what we're looking at. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah, no, you gotta oh, Google this. Oh, it's not even office. the same. Oh. It's exactly Those the are same. Wire glasses. These it's are like exactly thick little... the same. Okay. I can't think of anything that's more appropriate than this right now. So, uh, Tara, you got anything more? Um, back on point. Y- yeah. Well. I- not, not really. Thank, um, thanks a lot, Mo. I mean, you're, it, it was really uh, cool no speaking to you. Wish we could have seen your uh, face, soon. but yeah. Mo's, um, a, Mo's a basketball my, fan. He's a big kid. He's What are you, about 6'3"? Six, uh, six, six, if I stand up straight, which is rare, So because uh, you know, I work at a computer. But yeah, I love, I love basketball. As much, believe it or not, as much as I love cars, uh, I love my Lakers. So uh, Ooh, yeah. When, 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 I, when, wish, uh, when, I wish we had a picture of you um, playing basketball or even doing judo, you know. Oh, that's right. That would have been painful. I'm, I'm actually, my, my limbs are better now uh, since coming to Texas. I'm telling you that you guys have bad, bad limbs, that, that uh, PRP therapy, the platement rich injections like Kobe used to get. Uh-huh. Those, those, are, those are the business. They work. They work well. So, yeah. Oh, really? And 47 and, yeah, 47 and pain three, pain free. Uh, was having a lot of knee and elbow problems uh, that started you know before then and kept degenerating. So they let you heal. Well, me, Taro, and James, we have we have like little back, knee, everything problems, little by little. It, looks, yeah, this, it's, it seems like but, we take turns. Yeah. And in pain, but so. Sam, you know what we do have though? We do have people on the Facebook stream telling us that they agree that you look like the spitting image of Steven Seagal <laughs> eating a carrot. That's all we no, see. You're lying. You're lying. I'm not. Lying. I'm not. Well, if, you go, no, if you go if you go on lying. and look at our Facebook screen, <laughs> now you can see that. I mean <laughs> that is I'm one not gonna be able to, I'm not gonna be able to read my, read my right report now. without my glasses. I'm just I, saying I that I mean, all the people are seeing now is is Steven Seagal eating a carrot. You know Steven Seagal speaks very Japanese. So all right Mo we'll let you go. I know you gotta get back to work. Um uh um, thank you guys thank you for hoop. joining and uh thanks, we bro. will be in touch right. thanks bud all take right care, guys. talk to all you right. see you bye right. take care bye-bye okay moving on that was fun moving past the carrot is that what you want to do Sam? is that all the plan is now i don't even you, know what you you're can just keep this. the carrot up <laughs> no, shut up guys <laughs> <laughs>